Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ella Hansen. I am Councilmember Pinto's Legislative and Community Coordinator. Um, and we are so excited to have you all here tonight to discuss our Ward 2 budget priorities. Um, so I think we're about to get started. So I will turn it over to the council member. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ella, for all of your work um, and for our, our team who's put this together. We're all really excited to, to see many of you and hear from you all tonight in this new kind of virtual forum. Um, and, and thank you for joining us for the discussion around the fiscal year 2022 budget. So tonight our goal is to really hear directly from you on your priorities for the district's budget for this upcoming year. As many of you know, on March 31st, Mayor Bowser will send her proposed budget and financial plan to the council. And this proposed budget and financial plan includes the operating budget, which covers ongoing operations like education funding, support for our unhoused residents and small business grants, and include the capital improvement plan, uh, which includes things like development, improvement or replacement of district owned assets for a period of six years. Some examples of things included in the capital improvement plan in Ward 2 are renovations for Jellif Recreation Center, modernization of the Francis Stevens School, and street, streetscape projects like the K Street Transit Way, for example. And the completed budget will include the Local Budget Act, which determines how we can spend our local dollars here in the city, the Federal Portion Budget Request Act, which helps us make the best use and leverage our federal dollars, and the Budget Support Act, which includes legislative actions needed to accompany the budget. So my colleagues and I, after the mayor submits her budget, will have 70 days to review it and make proposed changes to the mayor's budget. So that does not give us much time. So I wanna make sure that I hear directly from you all about your priorities now before that clock starts ticking. This year's budget process is even more complicated than usual uh, due to the financial ramifications of the COVID-19 crisis. The Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, which is known as referred to as the CAFR, revealed that the city is facing a $493 million deficit in the fiscal year 2021 to 2024 budget and financial plan because the city has to balance the budget over the course of a four year period. Luckily, during the pandemic, the city also was able to finish the fiscal year 2020 budget in a strong financial position due to property and income tax growth, which offset many of the losses we faced. This highlights, however, that although it's been an incredibly difficult year for everyone, the most vulnerable district residents have struggled the most and at disproportionate rates. There is a lot of need from rent relief and additional permanent supportive housing vouchers to address the mounting eviction and homelessness crisis. We need additional funding for high dosage tutoring, especially to assist our at-risk students to account for all of the learning loss we've seen this year. We need expanded mental health resources to counter the mental health emergency brought on by stress, grief, and social isolation. And we need additional funding for violence prevention and interruption and other innovative public safety efforts. But tonight, I wanna to hear directly from you about your budget priorities for fiscal year 2022, so I can be the most effective advocate, ally, and representative as possible on behalf of our ward and our community. So this is going to work a little bit like a hearing um, we have four panels tonight with five speakers each. And so if you've signed up to speak, we're going to promote you to a panelist when it's your panel's turn. So we have four panels. I'm gonna read everybody's name on the panel now so you have a sense of when you may be up. So the first panel is Joanne Garlow, Paul Cadrero, Adam Stein, and Debbie Hanrahan. The second panel is gonna be Denise Snyder, Trupti Patel, James Harnett, Ruth Schimmel, and John Rensipis, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing that. Panel three will be Elizabeth Miller, Kishan Puta, Rachel Shank, Ed Solomon, and Gwendolyn Lose. And panel four will be Rahana Mohammed, Alexandra Bailey, Juan Uloa, Michelle Malotsky, and Marianne Lysenko. So 
Each panelist is going to have two minutes to present. You'll see a timer on the screen. Please be mindful of your time so that we can get through everybody on our list in an efficient manner. And if it's not your turn to speak, if I can ask that you please stay on mute. Um, please also send a copy of your written testimony to my team um, at ehansen at dccouncil.us. That's to Ella. And Ella, if I can ask if you put your email address in the chat so everybody has it so we can make sure we can review it in writing and have it on record. If you did not sign up to speak, but you would still like to submit your thoughts via written testimony, please feel free. And we would love for you to reach out to us and email your testimony to, to Ella as well. Know that you will also have the opportunity to share testimonies on specific agencies during the budget oversight process in the council. Right now, we're currently undergoing performance agents, performance oversight for many of the district agencies, which will inform our budget oversight next month. For specific hearing dates and participation instructions, we'll also put that link in the chat box, um, which can be found on our, on our DC Council website. So with that, thank you very much again. We're gonna have a great evening and we're gonna to move to our first panel. So again, panel one is gonna be Joanne Garlow, Paul Cadrero, Adam Stein, and Debbie Hanrahan. We will give everybody a moment to become panelists. Should I go first? Yes, we will start with you, Joanne. Thank you so much. Are we all set with the clock? A moment. I will be less than two minutes, so it's okay. I'll go quick. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Hello, hello, Council Member Pinto and everybody else who is here today and my neighbors. And I want to thank you for allowing me to testify at today's budget hearing. I thank you for your support for ending homelessness and the Ward 2 meeting you held on that priority, which I attended. So thank you for all you've been doing so far. Uh, I just want to state for the record that I support the Way Home campaign's priorities, including their ask that the city invest a little over $96 million to end chronic homelessness for 2,761 individuals and 432 families. As a Ward 2 homeowner, I'm happy to pay my fair share so we provide this service to the most vulnerable people and still have a balanced budget. I will amplify the Way Home Campaign's call to action. Uh, the, the coronavirus pandemic continues to magnify what we've long known as true, that housing is healthcare, that housing saves lives, and that housing is essential for individual and collective well-being and health. I believe that moving our, investing the money to move our neighbors into supportive housing will actually make all of Ward 2 be a better place and for all of us. And so that's my message. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Joanne. Appreciate that. Um, next, we will hear from Paul Cadario. Third time right, Brooke. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, want to focus on some rather bigger picture items rather than advocate for a particular uh, budget item or even area. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Gennaro. It's a little bit hard to hear you. All right, let me sit mm -hmm. closer. Is that better now? Yes. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to uh, basically talk about bigger picture issues. Uh, first, I think that everything that EC government spends and frankly, every expenditure at any level of government needs to be looked at as to whether the expenditure and the project advances climate action and climate justice. Um, I think that this should be obvious for capital projects, including during their construction and their eventual decommissioning. But I would urge that we actually use this lens to look at projects, look at the whole budget and that the mayor establish something to report to council that actually looks at the budget from this screen. That doesn't mean that the best need be the enemy of the better. Um, you don't need to paint a bike lane on every street that's been resurfaced uh, now, but at the same time, we need to be thinking ahead to the city we want to have and the public spaces we want to have 10 years from now, 20 years from now on everything we do. And while it's easy to get interested in things that are related to transfers to individuals. 
we need to look at the broader issue of public space and very expensive capital expenditures or arrays of them, whether they're bike lanes or sidewalk repairs that need to be addressed. Um, I'm not doing well. Um, secondly, I think that it, city agencies have not performed well in terms of establishing their credibility on some sorts of issues. I like to think they're professional, but I don't get the sense with virtual meetings that they're taking uh, the need to have the right people there seriously and to look as if they've coordinated within the D.C. government. Uh, DDOT is the worst example, but uh, we need to start looking at do these people know what they're doing and can they persuade us? And lastly, I would hope that the council won't use the opportunity of uh, windfall expenditures from property taxes and capital gains tax to do things that are not of high priority. Uh, I've just, uh, although the post office is holding my property tax bill hostage, I did go online and set up the electronic payment and I was a little shocked. So I would hope that we'll reestablish uh, a surplus and uh, you know, manage the situation, manage the budgetary situation with the medium and long term involved. Sorry, I've gone over. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Kadario. And my apologies for mispronouncing your name. Um, thank you for, for your thoughts. I appreciate appreciate all that. Um, next, we are going to hear from Adam Stein. Hello, and thank you so much for allowing me and us to speak. And <clears throat> thank you for what you do. Uh, I've never done this before, so please uh, excuse my informality. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing. I just know that I'm. Um, about this topic that I'm talking about, and I'm a, a passionate, and I, I know quite a deal about it, and how important it is. And it's just simple: it's food, it's waste management, food waste management, and and composting system. There is, um, it's easily, um, arguably, the greatest thing we can do for our planet. Um, and we've broken the cycle of life, and all organic matter is supposed to return back to the soil, and it doesn't; it goes to a landfill. Um, and to implement this, it's not reinventing the wheel. It's being done um, all over, uh, more and more and more. I've been to many different cities where it's a success, um, some more than others. It's happening right around here in town. I know two different companies that um, will do this. They, for 30, about 30 bucks a month, they'll weekly curbside pickup. And if you get 100 people in that community, that's, they, it cuts it in half. It's extremely, uh, uh, yeah. It's extremely cheap. I know, I know the town of Chevy Chase does it for free, it's barely subsidized. And I would love to even just to study to find out who else is interested in this. Um, I, I bet there's some people who would like to, you know, even donate to help to offset some of these costs. And uh, um, I was wondering if this is important to anybody else and to see what we can do as a community to get this done, because it's probably one of the easiest things that we could do that has the ultimate greatest effect on everything, because you know, we don't live in a bubble in this apartment, although it feels like we do lately because of COVID, but, you know, food comes in from out and, you know, we got to give food back out and, you know, all our surrounding lands. And so um, that's all I have to say about that. I would not trying to solve the problem here today. I would just, you know, see if we can get some sort of committee going. I'd love to start it to see what kind of surveys we can get going to see who else is interested in this in the community. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Adam. And, and I'm glad to hear this is your first time kind of participating in this way. It's great to have you um, and your input. And I'm sorry we lost some of the others on our first panel, um, but a lot of great ideas shared so far um, around the need for increased supports for our neighbors experiencing homelessness and ensuring that we provide the adequate funding and the necessary funding, um, action on climate change and climate justice. Um, I, I hear your point, Mr. Cadario, as well around real property taxes we are considering and, and looking at reforms in that area. Um, and Mr. Stein, I just wanted to comment on your really important point about composting. I actually just read a study over the weekend on how South Korea handles this. And it's really interesting thinking about the ways in which we can incentivize individual composting and empower our restaurants and businesses to do so as well. And so those are absolutely things um, that we're looking at for this year's budget. So thank you for, for mentioning them. Um, Debbie Hanrahan is here and we have you up next. 
you're still on mute, but whenever you're ready, if you take yourself off and you can go ahead. Am I on? Yeah. You're on. Oh, great. Thank you for holding this hearing. And thank you, Mr. Stein. I'm glad you're talking about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the planet. Um, I wanted to talk about solarization. I've Debbie, talking. it's a little bit hard to hear you. Oh, okay. You could just make sure that nothing's covering your microphone. Okay, can you hear me now? Um, a little bit. It's just a little bit soft. I can hear you, but if you could just try to speak up. Where do I push the thing? Is this better? Speak up. A little bit. Okay. Go ahead. I'll, I'll yeah. shout. Okay. Just, okay. Um, I'm not an expert uh, in solar. Uh, it's not one of my driving issues. But I was shocked to find out the other day that so many big DC government owned roofs are not solarized. I have no idea why this is so, and many of them are in war too. I am working very hard on something called McMillan Park, and I know that the city so far has authorized $117 million in, in bonds to give to that project. We will not own $117 million of that project. We hope in years to come, maybe a dozen years, that there will be some return at some point with new taxpayers. Imagine if we took that $117 million and solarized the convention center, uh, which is, by the way, is seven blocks of roof. There are no sh uh, buildings around it shading it. There were no trees shading it. It would be pure, it would be pure like green electricity. There is an inclination. I know this doesn't happen uh, as, as you do too, uh, Madam Councilwoman. This is not happening by chance. There is a disinclination to solarize. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know the basis, but it is a, it is a no brainer. If you solarize the roof, you get an immediate return. Um, we have abundant school buildings, libraries, playground uh, buildings, you name it. And why don't we require new buildings to solarize? I don't, I mean, new DC government buildings to solarize. What is the, um, the problem? And I think like the young man ahead of me, this is something that we should be doing for our planet. Green energy is just um, very abundant. We have a hot, sunny city <laughs> and it would be, we would be very successful. Yeah, good work. This is good luck. <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for, for that testimony. It's a great point um, and really important and distinction between incentivization and ma mandating something and as we, work towards our climate change goals and uh, lofty goals for the next decade, it's really important that we start to be more bold um, um, to get uh, us there. Um, council member, um, I, I, kind of I don't know if you can still hear me. I can. But, but I honestly think this is a political problem as opposed to a financial problem. I, I'm not wise enough to know what the political problem is but this truly is a no brainer. When you have a seven block building that you own and you have to heat and cool and you have no business in it. I mean, it's a real white elephant at the moment, this convention center to solarize the roof would give you an immediate break in your costs, uh, et cetera. So uh, that, is the, that is the best example, but we have the armory, we have the arena, we have so many buildings. Um, so anyway, good luck to you and good luck in your new job. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Those ideas. Well, we will look into that. Um, all right. That is our first panel. Um, thank you very much. We're going to move on to our second panel where you have Denise Snyder, Tripti Patel, James Harnett, Ruth Schimmel, and John Rents Zepis. John, once you get on here, you can correct me how to pronounce your name properly. All right, we will give him a moment to, to get on here. We're going to start first with Denise Snyder. Uh, good evening. Council member, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you a little bit today about uh, the budget for the district for 2022. Um, I'm executive director of the Foggy Bottom West End Village. We're one of 13 villages within the district and one of three villages that operate in your ward, Ward 2. 
of the residents of DC right now, approximately 87,500 of them are 65 years or older. And according to AARP, the number of older people will grow in the category of age 50 plus from 27% on a national basis to 43% by 2050. And there's no reason to assume that the district's growth, growth line would be any different than that. Basically, what studies have shown over and over again is that over three fourths of older adults want to remain in their homes as long as possible. It's interesting that the village's goal, any village's goal, is to help older adults remain in their home as long as possible while living the best life possible. Foggy Bottom West End Village helps make this possible by providing a wide range of services as well as educational, interesting, and just plain enjoyable programs. Village services range from providing transportation to grocery shopping to walking dogs to uh, helping with tech assistance. Our speakers cover everything from art and culture to educational programs, health and wellness opportunities, and the critically important social interactions. Everything a village does is about addressing social isolation, which pre-COVID impacted 25 to 30% of older adults. The CDC recognizes that social isolation is a critical factor in terms of negative health impacts, increasing dementia, for example, by 50% an increase if you're somebody experiencing social isolation. Villages operate much more cost effectively than the government does because we rely so heavily on volunteers who provide the services and conduct the programs. We're grateful for the funding that we've received from the city's budget through the Department on Aging and Community Living. And I would like to urge you and the rest of the city council to not only maintain that current level of funding, but to increase it at least to match the cost of living increases over the past several years that our grant has remained stable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise, and thank you for all of the work that you do. Um, if I can ask everybody on the panel to just stay until the end of this panel, and then we can have a discussion. Um, so next up, we have Commissioner Trupti Patel. Good evening, Councilwoman Pinto. Thank you for the opportunity to weigh in for what Ward 2 budget priorities should be. I strongly urge you to prioritize the funding to the following agencies slash services. The first being um, Department of Employment Services. Funding is used to get IT systems current and up to date, so no delay in getting survival funds to the workers. Proper staffing and dedicated staff to resolve issues so that claims are not stuck for months on end. Secondly, Deputy Mayor of Health and Human Services, our unhoused neighbors have been ex excluded in basic protections from COVID-19. We must pri prioritize their health and safety. Third, the Department of Health, having our contact tracing team expand and continue to educate the public so that the cases continue to decline. Ensuring the vaccine website is properly functional so that our most vulnerable residents are not carved out due to the digital divide. Lastly, DDOT slash WMATA. Ensuring that our city is walkable for all. Many of our sidewalks are in terrible shape and are dangerous for our elderly and ADA residents. Adequately fund public transit options such as metro or bus routes. Our essential and vulnerable workers who aren't making enough money or for having to face transit challenges to get to and from work. These guiding principles for the DC budgets should emphasize a strong and equitable pandemic recovery. The corner coronavirus pandemic continues to devastate our public health, key sectors of our economy, and our education systems. Black and brown residents are bearing the brunt of this hardship. The district should prioritize new bold investments. These investments will prevent evictions, bolster struggling hospitality industry, and provide support to students most harmed by the pandemic. By following these principles, the district leaders can support a strong and equitable recovery and help residents and businesses build back better. Thank you, Council One. Thank you so much, Commissioner Patel. Um, next, we have former chair of ANC 2A, James Harnett. Great, thank you, Councilmember Pinto and neighbors. 
Uh, thank you for putting together today's community uh, budget briefing. I hope this becomes a recurring tradition that the ward can rely on to share what's important to us with you every year. The DC Chief Financial Officer surprisingly announced earlier this month that we raised $552 million more in taxes than expected uh, in the budget over the last 12 months. I encourage you to use that surplus to improve the lives of our community by funding laws passed by the council, but those that remain unfunded. Critically, that includes both the Vision Zero Enhancement Omnibus Amendment Act of 2019 at a cost of $41.7 million in fiscal year 2020 and $171.5 million in fiscal year 2021. And the Birth to Three for All DC Act of 2018 at a cost of $227.1 million over four years. Central to the Vision Zero Bill are requirements that would mandate DDOT build sidewalks on both sides of all roads in the district, rather than existing law, which requires sidewalks on just one side making it easier for our neighbors with mobility challenges to get around, require the installation of protected bike lanes were called for in the multimodal long range transportation plan when engaging in road reconstruction or major repair, make it easier for ANCs and community members to request intersections be changed to always stops, require out of state drivers to take a written exam on DC traffic laws when transitioning their driver's license to the district, require the installation of more red light, bus lane, and stoplight enforcement cameras, and require DC to enter into agreements with Virginia and Maryland to force the payment of an estimated $1 billion in unpaid parking and speeding tickets by out-of-state drivers. Amid the birth to three bill are requirements to fully fund the DC child care subsidy program, improve compensation for child development educators, and create new positions to assist providers with licensing. The bill also creates programs to strengthen pre and postnatal support for mothers, expand mental, physical, and nutritional health programs, and increase parenting and family support. Both of these bills, if funded, would significantly improve the lives of our city's residents, providing pub families public free access to birth to 18 education for their children and safe streets for us all. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. And a, a really important point, I think, around there's always a, a need to do more and, and think about new ideas and initiatives. And sometimes it's really important that we just stop a moment and make sure that everything that we passed in the past is actually funded uh, before we, we keep doing more. So thank you for that. Um, next up, we have Ruth Schimmel. Hi, Ruth, you're still on mute. Ruth, Ruth, you're on mute still. Is that better? Yes, we can hear you now. Hi. Okay, sorry about that. I just no. want to give kudos for resilience and uh, continued support for both the West End Library and the Foggy Bottom Village, Foggy Bottom West End Village, because they've shown amazing resilience and creativity during COVID. And I think it's, it's representative of the way they operate in general. So it, both of them encourage individual self-sufficiency and learning. Um, community cohesion and, and collaboration is extremely important. And we don't have that many opportunities for interdisciplinary and exchange among ourselves. And, and both the village and the library permit that. Uh, it, decreasingly with the library now, but in, when it comes back on, when we're, when we're escaping from COVID, it'll be much, much better. Um, the village has been amazing at, at solving problems, including getting um, vaccine appointments and things like that, wide range of learning opportunities and stimulation. Uh, it brings local communities together for commiseration and friendship, and it encourages individual, most importantly, individual self-sufficiency avoiding dependency, government spending actually in the long run, um, and, and um, avoiding institutional care. So all of these, both, both the library and the village provide tremendous interaction opportunities and marvelous opportunities for our brains to stay static or to re escape being static and, and um, continue learning, which is important for mental health as well as, as health in general. That's it. 
Well, really, really important points, Ruth. Thank you so much, especially now. I think you see that our brains are muscles like any other part of our body right. and incredibly important that we utilize them. Right. Um, all right, last on this panel, we have John Rent Zapis. Uh, uh, thank you, Council Member Pinto, for hosting this Ward 2 budget community meeting. My name is John Rent Zepis. Uh, I live in Georgetown and serve as the co chair for the Citizens Association of Georgetown Public Safety Committee. And I speak this evening on behalf of CAG, which represents the residents of Georgetown. Uh, since last summer, these residents have grown increasingly worried and frustrated by the increasing amount of violent crimes being committed in our neighborhood. While several categories of crime are down in the city, there have been many incidents involving guns that have made residents fearful for their lives. Just this year, Georgetown has experienced an armed carjacking, an armed robbery, and a drug-related murder by gunshot. And as an aside, council member, uh, we appreciate that you came to the crime scene last Thursday to learn firsthand from on-scene officers uh, what had transpired. Uh, there was also a murder by gun in Georgetown uh, last November. Several residents have either moved out of Georgetown or have considered doing so as a direct result of these violent gun-related activities. And a much higher number of residents are afraid to walk their own sidewalks at night, including people with dogs. These crimes and others involving guns and the legitimate fear they have created weigh heavily on the minds of Georgetown residents. Consequently, we are concerned that proposed budget cuts to the MPD operating and capital budgets will reduce the number of officers to approximately 3,500, down about 300 from the current level. We know that money is being shifted from the MPD operating budget to other city agencies, such as neighborhood safety engagement, victim services, justice grants, and eviction services. At many levels, this makes sense as a more wide ranging approach to dealing with crime and its consequences is necessary. However, with violent crimes rising and 198 murders in 2020 district wide, and that trend continuing in 2021, CAG firmly believes that more police officers need to be patrolling the streets and not less. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry for everybody who's experienced violence this year in any capacity. It is extremely traumatic um, and not something anybody in our city should have to go through. And so we know that's a lot more focus, focus is needed. Um, so if Denise is still here, I just wanted to ask you about many of the members of your villages. You know, we've spoken about the need to age in place and have that process be affordable. Um, two weeks ago, I co-introduced a couple of bills with my colleague, Ward 7, Councilmember Vince Gray, um, around expanding relief for real property taxes for our seniors and ensuring that more of our seniors can age in place. Do you find that most of your members are renters or homeowners? Um, and is that data that, that you all collect as you provide services to your members? Well, the data that we have on that council member would be anecdotal, but I can say that a significant majority of our members are homeowners. So property tax relief would be, uh, would be very helpful. Um, unfortunately, a lot of older adults who may live in properties that have a pretty high value are still living on very limited fixed incomes. So um, relief from that perspective would be, uh, would be greatly appreciated and very helpful. Absolutely. Well, thank you for all that you do. And one of the bills that we introduced does raise the threshold cap um, with that understanding that, that you have provided around the um, real property taxes continuation, but being on a fixed income. So thank you for your advocacy there as well. Um, Commissioner Patel, I wanted to ask you, you, you shared a lot of really important priorities. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the sidewalks because I know that these continue to be a huge safety hazard. How are your constituents letting you know about these issue areas? And can you kind of walk us through your process in making these individualized complaints so that as we're engaged in performance and budget oversight, we can make sure that broadly, um, in addition to funding, agency has what they need. 
Well, one of the reasons why I keep yelling about the side walks is that I fell and shattered my left elbow on one of them in 2A and I'm having to sue the city um, to get them to cover like basically my medical bills. Um, what I've done is like, I've just tried to encourage people to, you know, amplify the 311 request. I mean, you know, we've been working with um, the DDOT War 2 liaison, uh, Andrew DeFrank, who's wonderful. And, you know, basically, you know, we've been trying to work with him to see how we can get like a lot of the infrastructure in 2A to be walkable. I mean, some of these sidewalks, you can't walk if you're somebody that's ADA. Like, I mean, I really worry about, you know, one of my more vulnerable residents like tripping and like breaking their hip. Like some of these sidewalks, you can't go down if you're, if you, if you need a wheelchair. And so for me, you know, I've just been trying to listen to my neighbors when, you know, like, even when I go walk around, they're always like, oh, like, when is this sidewalk going to get fixed? And, you know, I've, I've gone through three different D dot liaisons, like saying and amplifying, like, I need this fixed. So um, I know um, Mr. DeFrank has said that it is um, an issue of budget. It is an issue of money in getting some of the sidewalks getting fixed that even though we have been complaining for about the last two years or more than that for these sidewalks to get repaired, it's it's just a matter of finance. Okay, thank you so much. Uh -huh. so Council member, if I could just add my voice to that to say, sure. uh, you know, the block that our office is on, which is K Street between 24th and 25th, is horrible. Um, we have members who use walkers and they literally have to walk on that access roadway from K Street in order to get to our office because the sidewalk is impassable. You know, if you've got a baby, uh, if you've got a baby carriage, you know, if you have any kind of mobility or balance problems, it's a huge issue. Um, the, the brick sidewalks look wonderful, but they're horrible in terms of maintenance and upkeep and usability. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. That is terrible and we will look into that. It's a, a incredibly important important component of the budget. Thank you, Council, um, and we appreciate your support. Um, Mr. Renzepis, I just wanted to follow up about some of the work of CAG. Um, you know, the city has been engaged in increased investments in violence interruption part of which you, you noted and, and will be more investments this year. And the models have proven to be extremely successful in the parts of the city where they are, but they're small areas, they're small pilot programs. Right. Um, and so, you know, the broad reaching need uh, throughout the city of making sure that we're curbing violence at it and addressing the root causes of it continues to be important. Um, we see this in kind of a lot of different areas within our neighborhoods in Ward 2 that groups of dedicated citizens have kind of taken it upon themselves to perform what otherwise would be government services, you know, it's like LCCA, Logan Circle doing street cleanings, for example, in groups like CAG. And so I was hoping you can elaborate a little bit on the, the work of CAG so that um, the government can make sure that we are supporting you in, in that effort. So do you mean the public safety side of it? I mean the public safety committee, yes. Okay, so is that something you'd like me to provide it in writing that would be helpful? Or, um, I mean, right now, I mean, obviously the, there's a, a component. We have a, a patrol officer that patrols Georgetown uh, seven nights a week uh, from uh, about six o'clock to two in, the, two in the morning. And uh, it used to be five days a week, but uh, as a result of the, uh, violence that happened uh, in the second half of last year, including some of the uh, Trump protests and demonstrations, we changed to a seven night uh, patrol model. Uh, we have security cameras uh, throughout the uh, Georgetown area to concentrate on exits and entrances. And we would uh, like to see if there's a possible way to partner with the city for some license plate readers. I know MPD has uh, deployed officers to monitor <clears throat> Uh, P Street and Q Street with uh, license plate readers mounted in their cars, and uh, that's quite a quite a hefty uh, expense to have officers sit and just monitor cars coming and going. So that's something we're looking to expand this year as well uh, to have more cameras, as we have found through uh, talking with Commander Bedlian and other uh, people in in the in um, the second district office that. Uh, 
having cameras certainly has, has been helpful for uh, solving crimes. So that's what we're looking to expand as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank you all for your service and your engagement for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We're gonna move on to our third panel um, where we have Elizabeth Miller, Kishan Puta, Rachel Shank, Ed Solomon, and Gwendolyn Los. On a moment here, um, and we are first going to start with Commissioner Elizabeth Miller. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Kishan, you're sideways, that's cool. <laughs> I wanna thank you, um, Council Member Pinto. I kind of wanna <laughs> second what James said, which is I really love this idea of hearing from Ward 2 um, leaders, constituents, community activists, and elected officials just about very hyper-local issues. So I'm really thankful to you for doing that. I would also like to thank you and your staff for joining me and Commissioner Puta on a tour of the Jellif Recreation Center last fall. You and your staff saw firsthand the state of the building, which is essentially totally unusable in its current state. ANC2E's office is housed in the building, which can't be used because it isn't ADA accessible and we have a commissioner in a wheelchair. The HVAC HVAC system is on its very last leg and the building hasn't been renovated in any significant way since it was built in the 50s. It's way past time to get this building renovated. We are grateful to you for securing money for the feasibility study that will be delivered soon and give us a more accurate sense of how much money we will need to bring this building into the 21st century. I think it's fairly obvious that the current $7 million budget allocation isn't going to make this building the community center we are all envisioning. I have visited many recently renovated centers around the city and they are spectacularly beautiful and absolutely brimming with neighbors, exercising in the wellness spaces, playing chess and other games with their neighbors, hosting interesting classes and seminars. Our community has never had this type of space and we're really excited at the opportunity to build something truly unique. Additionally, as you know from your visit during the school year, there are 100 public school children from all eight wards attending the aftercare program on site. They have no outdoor space and are relegated to being indoors in a windowless basement with outdated computers and amenities and they really do deserve and, and need better. Um, there's also this incredibly popular basketball program you know about that is scheduled to within an inch of its life, thanks to Bob Stowers, and it puts children from all eight wards on the courts and truly is the heartbeat of the building. I have my fingers and toes and everything crossed for more resources this year so that we can do this right and have a state-of-the-art center for the communities of Georgetown, Berlieve, and for the public school kids. Please let me know how I can be helpful to you as you go through the budget process. I'm here ready and willing to do whatever you need. Lastly, as long as we're talk taking, um, talking budget, a quick, quick plug for a small dollar item, I think. I'd love to see Georgetown receive funding for a small area plan. We are in need of a data-driven community-based strategic planning. We needed this before COVID and we needed even more post-pandemic. Like to see the city invest in Georgetown, which faces unique challenges and unique opportunities. Our success can be yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Miller. And I meant to say this after James Harnett's testimony as well. This will absolutely be an annual um, event. Hopefully, uh, hopefully next year we won't have to do it on Zoom. We could do one Zoom option and one in-person option maybe, but um, I, I agree and, and I'm excited that this will be an ongoing event. Um, so thank you very much. Next, we have Commissioner Puta. Hi, Councilmember Pinto. Can you hear me all right? Yes. And uh, hello to my fellow Ward 2 residents. Uh, uh, it's nice seeing everybody after a long time and nice of you to bring us together, council members. Uh, it will be a great tradition if you uh, continue it. Thanks for doing it. Um, uh, what I want to talk to you about tonight in my, uh, I represent uh, ANC District 2E01, uh, home to beautiful Ellington Field. Uh, I think you might be able to see my son Ohm in the background having his uh, strawberry dessert. He uh, 
he uh, he and I and my wife, we were at that field just this evening in the nice weather. Uh, lots of Burleith and Hillendale residents and Georgetown residents were there enjoying uh, that field. It is a community gem. And uh, un unfortunately, there was unnecessarily a controversy about it last year because um, the city transferred it from the school system to the park system. Uh, uh, kind of without uh, talking to the community and uh, the community had some uh, mistrust of the parks uh, department last year because of what happened with uh, the giveaway of the Jellif playing field. And uh, we hope that that, uh, that trust can be regained and that we can work together with the city um, to, uh, to uh, on uh, all of our amenities, especially at Ellington Field. The problem uh, is Councilmember Pinto just this very week uh, something happened and, uh, and DPR promised, uh, you know, to regain our trust and to make sure they let, would let us know whenever anything happened in the process for that field, which is uh, right, like, you know, meter, me, meters away from lots of people's homes. And, uh, uh, the, and yet the first that you or, uh, sorry, the first that I and presumably you uh, heard of uh, progress being made on that process was at the public uh, hearing this week uh, at, of DPR's performance hearing that they've chosen a contractor for that project. It's definitely the first I or anyone in my neighborhood heard, have heard about it. And uh, so, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it's, <laughs> it's not a great start uh, for them to you know, not let us know when a contractor has been selected for this big project in our neighborhood. Uh, we hope that that will improve, that, that we hope that you'll help us make sure, hold their feet to the fire to uh, keep us closely abreast about everything that uh, they have planned for that field. We have a, a really good public process. And lastly, uh, that field was, uh, was supposed to uh, be able to serve Hardy Middle School and its lack of field space. But now we see that uh, there's a decent uh, chance and proposal out there from the uh, from DCPS that Hardy would move and a high school would open up in Hardy's place. And a high school has even more sports needs, even more field needs. Uh, so for all of these reasons, we think it's very important that, uh, that we get clarity on uh, the DCPS stuff, and which will also affect Jellif Rec Center and its needs. Is it going to have a high school across the street or a junior high across the street? Uh, and how big will it be? So uh, we want both the DCPS and DPR to communicate in the planning of these DPR projects mm -hmm. and with the neighborhood on what's going on with uh, Hardy. We don't have representation from Mr. our neighborhood. I'm sorry, I've been trying to... Gonna give you the eye if you agree to sure. the graph. We don't we don't have representation from our neighborhood on that working group to find out. Uh, and they'll be meeting next week and we hope that we will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And when it comes to Allington, we are monitoring that closely. We actually just met with DGS about uh, this today and we'll comment on how important it is and ask them to make sure to include the ANC commissioners um, and, and you uh, in those developments as we move forward. So thank you for, for raising that. Um, next, we have Rachel Shank. Good evening, Council Member Pinto and community members. My name is Rachel Shank. I'm the Executive Director of Georgetown Main Street. I wanted to start by thanking you for creating an opportunity for us to speak with you about War II priorities for fiscal year 22. The mission of Georgetown Main Street is to promote and retain diverse small and local businesses along Wisconsin Avenue from K Street to Whitehaven Parkway. I'd like to raise a few opportunities that could greatly benefit these businesses. First, the Great Streets Corridor Program, which is designed to support existing small businesses, attract new businesses, increase the district's tax base, and create new job opportunities, ends at R Street on Wisconsin Avenue, cutting out hundreds of deserving small businesses further south. With over 20 business closures in the GMS corridor since March and dozens of deteriorating buildings that tenants are expected to maintain, Great Street grants could provide necessary support to the businesses south of R Street. The average Georgetown Main Street award in a normal year is about $3,000. Access to these Great Street corridor program grants would free up or create grants that are up to 13 times that to fund major projects. Second, 
Two blocks along Wisconsin Avenue between R Street and Whitehaven Parkway are neglected segment of the corridor. The Georgetown Bids District ends at R Street and the clean team that serves Glover Park Main Street stops at Whitehaven Parkway. More than 30 independent businesses in this forgotten stretch are omitted from coverage of services like removal of litter and graffiti, maintenance of street trees and landscaping. An extension of the legislated Wisconsin Avenue clean team from Glover Park Main Street would provide public space maintenance that this community deserves. And third, GMS would like to acknowledge the hundreds of thousands of dollars that have flowed into small businesses in the GMS corridor through the DC government grants that have kept businesses afloat. We recommend that the budget, budget for the upcoming fiscal year reflect similar grant programs. We also hope that Main Street programs maintain full funding in fiscal year 22, so we can continue to connect businesses resources, provide technical assistance, promote the corridors and offer critical grants. Thanks for your time and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you for all that you do for our small businesses. Um, those are really helpful points of feedback. Um, all right, next we have Ed Solomon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll probably piggyback on uh, something that John said that my area of concern is uh, uh, safety. Uh, I'm currently the president of the Georgetown Business Association and also 14 years on the Advisory Neighbor Commission chairing the Safety Committee. Uh, police reform and maintaining adequate police presence in our neighborhoods is not a binary choice. I'm for a holistic approach to addressing uh, crimes such as mental health services being used. We can do both, we must do both. Everyone has the right when the sun goes down to be able to walk to their local grocery store or favorite restaurant. Also consider the economic impact crime is having on businesses. I know in my community, there is a palpable fear and concern from residents and businesses that they can become a victim when venturing out at night or a victim in their place of business. This fear pertains to neighborhoods throughout the district. I'm very concerned that our current MPD staffing of officers if reduced to 3,500 officers will not be sufficient to meet the safety needs of our community. I'm aware we can debate those figures and talk about smart policing, but the stats do not su support reduction of police presence. Our population is around 700,000. Violent crime categories of robberies, homicides, and auto theft are up. More guns are being taken off the street. More crimes are committed in Georgetown using guns. In the past four months, we've had two homicides in our community and the mayor's investment of 15 million plus to establish a gun violence protection prevention emergency operations center illustrates the seriousness of the crime picture. I would like to see the data supporting the violence interrupter program. Is it working? Will funding be available for new recruit classes come this fall? For those officers retiring or leaving the force, will those officers be replaced? And do you support money in the 2022 budget to replace these officers? Let me be clear, I support police reform. How we implement that reform to address the, to address the inequities in policing cries out for long overdue solutions. However, it is important these reforms are making a significant impact to reducing crime and results matter. That's it. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Solomon. Um, and. You know, I think when it comes to the budget, when it comes to legislation, when it comes to everything we do, we, we try to make sure that data is driving all of our decisions um, as we move forward. So thank you all very much. I also want to just give another um, shout out to Commissioner Puta and Commissioner Miller, who have this feasibility study for Jellif Recreation Center due to their hard work and community organizing and engagement uh, got over 700 respondents to answer that survey. Um, and as many of us in this call who have been involved in local government or who serve on an ANC commissioner or in a various uh, local community organization capacity know how hard it is to get people to answer surveys. Sometimes there is 10 respondents or 30 respondents as we saw with, with Ready to Play. And so it's a huge testament to all of your hard work. And I, I hope mobilizes everyone else in this call when we need to get information out um, to not just think, well, I'm just one voice. I, um, I'm just going to ask a couple of people to really all take our responsibilities seriously. So thank you so much for that. 
Um, and thank you, Rachel and Ed, for your testimony. Really, really appreciate your thoughts and ideas tonight. Um, we are going to move on to our last panel, um, where we have Alexandra Bailey, Juan Uloa, Michelle Malotsky, and Marianne Lysenko. I don't think Rahana Mohammed is here, but if you are, just flag for us in the chat and we'll let you in. Or I should say convert you. All right, so we are going to start with Commissioner Alexandra Bailey. Good evening, Council Member Pinto. Long time no see. Uh, uh, so I have a, a number of things that I want to get through uh, in, in the time that I have. Um, the first is I would like to talk about having some updates done to Horizon House and Claridge Towers. Um, thank you very much to you and your staff for helping me remediate the rats uh, that were biting seniors in the head. But as you know, you've been to the building. They're outdated. They have not had much updates uh, since the 1980s. And air quality is proving to be a real uh, issue for the seniors there. And during the time of COVID, I think that's something that we need to pay particular attention to. Um, I also would like to speak out on, um, or speak out in my support of the Way Home campaign. Um, I'm regularly reached out to as the chair of public safety by buildings um, that are concerned with the homeless population in front of their building. Um, as the captains and uh, um, commanders that often attend my meetings tell them, there's really not much that they can do um, about people on public sidewalks. Um, so my feeling is, is that we need to get people into homes. Um, I believe one, it will reduce tension in the community. Um, that currently exists, in addition to the fact that it's just quite clearly the right thing to do. Um, I would also encourage you in your oversight uh, to take a look at voucher discrimination. I'm getting a number of calls from people who have received their vouchers, um, but basically um, are being told very arbitrary reasons why they are being rejected. Um, and I would like that to be looked into in a more robust way. Um, as I'm sure Brian Romanowski, who's on your staff, has told you, 2F is in need of a lot more trash cans, public trash cans. Um, so I would encourage uh, the increase there. I would also like to encourage you to support the public bathroom bill. Um, McPherson Square Park, which is in my single member district, uh, is currently uh, being revamped. And I would like public bathrooms to be included for two reasons. One is we address homelessness. Defecation in public is one of the primary complaints that I get on public safety. Um, I believe that one, we should of course be offering people the dignity to have a uh, clean and safe space uh, to relieve themselves. But again, I think this will also reduce uh, tension uh, within the community. And lastly, um, I am going to ask for a $273 million reduction over the next three, year, three years from the MPD budget um, to be reallocated towards public health and safety. Um, I, I grew up here in DC. DC is a pussycat compared to what it used to be. Um, but at this juncture, what we have to realize is that all of the studies around public safety show there's a higher correlation between poverty and crime than there is between an increased presence of cops and crime. Um, when New York Police Department instituted stop and frisk, et cetera, crime went up. When I took it away, crime went down. We've increased our police budget. Our crime has not gone down. Perhaps we need to talk about a new system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Bailey. A lot of really important ideas there. I just want to flag for you, there will be bathrooms in Franklin Square, um, which is very exciting. And, and that's set to be done hopefully by this summer, that project. Um, uh, they were talking about not allowing them to be public though, which was my concern, that they would be locked like at night. Interesting. Okay. My, my latest update with that there, I'll, we'll look into that and, and get back to you on that. For the next I would question. appreciate that clarity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. And, and your comments about moving neighbors into homes, I think, you know, no matter what, uh, wh which perspective you're coming at this from, if you are a homeowner who is 
uh, worried about a neighbor who is living in encampment in front of your home, or if you are a neighbor living in an encampment, the health providers, mental health care providers, housing providers, everybody's in agreement that we need vouchers and we need to move people into housing is the solution, um, which is why I think permanent supportive housing vouchers are so important um, as we continue supporting our neighbors experiencing homelessness. And so thank you for your, for your comments there. Um, next, we will have Juan Uloa. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Council Member Pinto, for uh, putting this together. Uh, I'm here tonight um, as Vice President of the Ward 2 Education Council, but more importantly, um, speaking as a, a DCPS parent. Um, my family and I have lived in the district and Ward 2 specifically since 2007. With respect to Ward 2 budget priorities, my three primary concerns are vaccinations for school staff, uh, ensuring funding for social workers and psychologists in Ward 2 schools, and pay parity for Duke Ellington School of the Arts teachers. Uh, by way of background, um, I lost my mother to COVID uh, April 15th of 2020. Uh, my wife, Kayla, is a cancer survivor and immune compromised. Unfortunately, she's not a candidate for either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine because of pre-existing allergies. Uh, our daughter, Natalia, is a freshman at Ellington and has yet to physically enter the building. Uh, given the loss of her grandmother and her mother's very real health concerns, Natalia is very reluctant to return to school until COVID is quote, under control. Uh, to Ellington's credit, she feels like a genuine member of the community, but nothing, as you know, can replace walking through those halls in person. Uh, Ellington is the only dual curriculum public arts high school in the District of Columbia. Under normal circumstances, it offers a complete roster of traditional and arts subjects. Uh, unfortunately, DCPS funding models treat Ellington as a traditional school. What that means is that only uh, that 27 out of the 56 teachers are not funded. To stretch the budget, Ellington teachers are paid on average $25,000 less than their DCPS counterparts. Uh, your support to help obtain pay parity will ensure that our best and brightest can stay and make a living as Ellington teachers. Lastly, uh, the only way Ward 2 children can safely return to in-person classes and perform academically is to ensure that the adults around them and uh, are not only fully vaccinated, but the specialists are available to address the psychological ramifications of COVID. I can attest personally that no one in my household is okay. Normal is a long way off. Um, we need to do right by our children and the adults who care for them by meeting their needs in a holistic fashion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. And I'm so sorry to hear about the loss of your mother. It's just a- Thank you. Terrible, terrible disease. Um, we are going to hear next from Michelle Malotsky. Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak and it's been a real pleasure listening to everybody's comments. Um, I'm Michelle Malotsky, I'm the program manager for Logan Circle Main Streets. We're a program of District Bridges and we started last year in 2019. I started a month before the pandemic and um, we have 173 businesses on the corridor at the moment. Um, District Bridges' mission is to enrich neighborhood vitality by bridging community engagement and economic development opportunities. Um, since the pandemic, I've been able to work with 120 businesses along the corridor. That's about 70% of all the businesses. Um, in terms of budget priorities, the two things that I would like to focus on are um, attraction and retention of businesses and services for people experiencing homelessness. Along 14th Street, 
uh, seven, I'm sorry, 69% of our businesses are currently locally owned, 16% of them are women owned, and also 16% are minority owned businesses. And over half of our businesses have been in business for over 10 years. During the pandemic, eight businesses, I'm sorry, <laughs> 14 businesses have permanently closed. Um, that's 8% of the total businesses along the corridor. And I estimate that's roughly 300 full-time jobs. We do have four new businesses that are opening. So that's kind of exciting. But as you can see, we obviously concerned about businesses closing, job loss and vacancies. Of the businesses that have closed, 70% of them have been locally owned. Um, and just a little more information, of the businesses that have not, oh, I am rapidly running out of time. So I'm just going to say that I've submitted this information to you. But what I wanna say is that there are some immediate steps that we can take to support locally owned businesses, such as the streeteries and um, expanding that to non-restaurant businesses um, to promote local businesses through different events like the dog days of summer and I'm just gonna to cut to the chase and also talk a little bit about homelessness because that's a huge concern for residents and business owners in Logan Circle. Unfortunately, it continues to be a great problem. Um, specifically, I would like to see us work on outreach and connecting people to services and permanent supportive housing and also um, a day center so people have some place to be during the day. So thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. I know two minutes is not enough. Um, and thank you so much for all of the work and support that you provide to our local businesses. I know many of them rely completely on you and your partnership, um, as does our office. So thank you. Um, all right, last up, we have Marianne Lysenko. Marianne, have you been able to reconnect? I will give you another moment. Um, feel free to just jump in if you're, oh, hello? Marianne, it looks like you're off mute on my end. Try speaking. Okay, unfortunately it's not working, but if you have any written testimony, we would love to see it if you can email it to us. Um, and I'm sorry for the, the technical difficulties. Um, if it starts working, please feel free to jump in. Um, Commissioner Bailey, I wanted to follow up with you. Um, you, as I mentioned, mentioned a lot of really important ideas, um, but this idea of needing more trash cans is something that's been very important to me for a long time. I actually ran for freshman class president of my high school on the basically sole platform of more trash cans. Um, so I've, I know Those one issue time. voters, huh? <laughs> That's right. Um, but anyway, so this is something I, I'm constantly noticing. And one of the issues that we've faced in advocating for more trash cans is that they are generally not placed in residential areas because it's too loud um, in you know early morning hours to pick them up. And so I'm curious if you've been hearing about that balance from residents, if it's something more that you're noticing, or if you have any ideas around getting more public litter cans, but doing so in a manner that won't be disturbing to our residential neighbors. So, I mean, we have a massive unemployment problem. We have a massive unemployment problem, particularly for people in re-entry. Um, I think that there is a way, one, to put the community in contact with people that they're normally not in contact with um, by creating a system whereby people would go into the neighborhoods and pull the bags um, rather than the truck rolling down and create that as an employment um, program. Because as we know, those are uh, union jobs. They have good benefits. Um, and I think that they should specifically be offered to people who are often uh, neglected coming back into community because we have a problem with recidivism, um, which is part of our crime problem. Um, if we're not giving people other options, then we are responsible for the crime on our streets. You know, um, what else are people? What else? What, what else can you do to eat? Um, so that's what I would recommend. Uh, so that we basically have like a, a foot team, 
if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially in areas um, where we have more narrow streets, which is a lot of Logan Circle um, and a lot of tight alleyways that already exist um, and more residential neighborhoods. I think that that's a, a great way to do it. And then also we always have complaints about leaves and trees uh, during the holidays. Again, another place that we can increase, um, you know, keep those folks employed. Okay, great ideas. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Aloha, if you're still there, thank you for raising uh, the issues around Duke Ellington and the pay disparities, which are absolutely unacceptable. Um, and if there's somebody at Duke Ellington who has been kind of collecting this data and wants to send it to our office, um, I would be very appreciative of, of that data so we can try to do something about it. I'll be happy to facilitate that for you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and Michelle, I just wanted to give you another moment. I know you were um, starting to say some ideas around additional actionable supports for our small businesses, one of which is, of course, expanding streeteries for not just the restaurants, but other local retailers. And then I set, sensed you had another part of the sentence. Oh, no, thank you so much. Um, actually, I was able to submit a letter from some of the yoga fitness centers. We have actually, um, I think about 10 independent fitness businesses in Logan Circle, and they've been really terribly hurt because of the social, I mean, as everyone has been, of course, but, um, you know, they don't, it's harder for them to set up outside. So um, find, helping them find alternatives for public spaces would be tremendously helpful. And I was able to send a, a submit a letter in addition to my um, to my statement from Deborah Michelov on um, some ideas about how we could use public space more effectively for yoga and other kinds of fitness. I think it's something that we need in general, but specifically um, exercise as a way to help with stress. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And because of that great idea and advocacy, it is something we raised to DGS today. Um, Fortunately, they don't have any spaces, avail any spaces available at the moment, um, but a good PSA reminder that DPR is providing permits. Um, I don't know. I don't have the authority to offer McPherson Park, but that sounds amazing, Michelle. <laughs> so. Oh, well, thank you. Um, so I'm help getting uh, National Park Service's attention. We'd love to do something in Logan Circle. Um, the parking lot, the DPR parking lot on S Street, I think could be cool. Even the plaza at the Reeves Center. Um, we don't have a lot of public space in Logan Circle, but we'd like to be able to use every inch of it. Um, oh, also Garrison Elementary School or Seton Elementary School. It's hard to figure out, you know, how to get permission to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. When it comes to the parking lot on S Street, DGS did say they are utilizing that space. Um, and Garrison, okay. I know, has been um, very gracious and sometimes allowing people to, to use the space, but of course not when the students are there. Um, and so we'll, we'll continue aiding in that coordination um, as well. well as thank you. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much. My apologies that we went um, a bit over, but I am really thrilled that I had the opportunity to hear from so many of you tonight. As I said, this is certainly gonna be an annual event um, and this is not the only time we can communicate. Please continue to, to write into our office with other ideas and questions and priorities, um, particularly with kind of testimony as it relates to this year's budget. Uh, again, please email that to Ella Hansen from our office, which is ehansen at dccouncil.us. Now I really wanna thank as well my team, um, Ella Hansen, who's our legislative and community coordinator, and Emmanuel Brantley, who's our communications director, and Brian Romanowski, who is our constituent services coordinator, have been working tirelessly um, since they've started, really, uh, to, to make sure that they're helping our office represent you all uh, as best we can. So, so thank you to them for all their hard work. Um, and thank you to everybody for being here. I really believe and know that Ward 2 has the most engaged citizens and neighbors. Um, I think our A and C commissioners are absolutely incredible and continue to go above and beyond to serve all of their constituents. And I'm just excited as we keep continue going through the performance oversight process, as we enter budget season, um, there are a lot of priorities that Ward 2 has, many of which we heard about tonight that we will be 
championing on your behalf um, and providing updates as soon as we have them through our newsletter, through social media. Um, so keep being engaged and keep pushing us to, to do better to represent you most adequately. So thank you all very much and I hope you have a great evening.